Can you imagine going in for a facial and later finding out you are diagnosed with HIV? At least three women have been infected with HIV after getting this cosmetic procedure called a vampire facial in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And if you don't know what a vampire facial is, it's a procedure where they take a sample of your blood from your body, then separate the plasma and the red blood cells, and then they inject the plasma back into your face with micro needling. And there's a number of reasons why people get this done. A major one being to brighten the skin, improve fine lines, wrinkles, acne, and overall rejuvenate the skin. But after these women were diagnosed, an investigation was conducted and it turns out that this spa was unlicensed. They also found unlabeled tubes of blood lying on the kitchen counter and syringes stored in the fridge along with food. It's also been said that this spa was reusing disposable equipment, which is most likely how these people were infected. This clinic had hundreds of clients and it's possible that more people were infected but they just don't know it yet. The clinic was closed down and the owner was sentenced to two years in prison. The terrifying human being you see in this photo killed his entire family twice. This man is Gregory Green and in 1991 he stabbed his wife in the face and chest killing her and their unborn child. He then called 911 and waited for the police to come. After serving 16 years in prison, he was released in 2008 with the support of family and friends, including a pastor who lobbied on his behalf. He then married Faith Harris, the pastor's daughter, and became a stepfather to her two teenage children, and the couple would go on to have two daughters of their own. However, on September 21, 2016, Faith found herself bound with duct tape and zip ties in the basement of their Michigan home. Her foot had been shot, her face slashed with a box cutter, and her four children were dead. The killer was her husband, and just as Gregory did when he killed his first wife, he called 911 and waited for police to come. He is now serving life in prison. Let's hope he actually stays put this time. This is a case that I came across late last year and I haven't been able to get it off my mind. Lauren was killed by her boyfriend or her ex-boyfriend, I should say. Word got around town that she was missing and people were starting to freak out. So the search for Lauren started right away and very quickly into their search, they actually made a huge discovery. That night, Lauren's red Jeep was found in the Wayland Town Beach parking lot with its windows rolled down. Her purse and computer were still inside, but there was no sign of Lauren. They actually specifically specifically asked if her ex-boyfriend could be involved once hearing about the fact that she had recently broken up with him and her friends even were like, no, there's no way he would have done anything to her. Nathan wasn't violent, at least not to their knowledge. But of course the police know that anything is possible. Even the people that you would never expect could do something absolutely can. So they of course got in contact with Nathan right away. That night they drove to Nathan's house where they spoke with him and his mom, Beth. However, it sounded at least initially like he had an alibi. He did admit to seeing Lauren that night. He said that she was in her car and pulled up. They had a five minute, very awkward conversation according to him, but that was it. She drove off and he hadn't seen her since. But his alibi and that story were about as strong as a twig because 48 hours later, he was being arrested for murder. Marcus married his 15-year-old stepdaughter. My heart goes out to her. She was way too young to be dealing with anything like this. And even though their finances don't sound like they were especially stable, they kept having children. I mean, think pregnancy after pregnancy. Because by the time she was 26 years old, Elizabeth had given birth, and this is not an exaggeration, 11 times. Now, given that the first pregnancy was when she was 15, that works out to a baby every single year. I can't even imagine. It's literally like you're pregnant for 10 years straight. That would be horrific. I don't, I didn't mind being pregnant, but that would be horrific. I mean, it honestly would be hard on anyone, but she was also so young that it would make it that much more difficult. Marcus basically stole her childhood away from her in so many different ways. The infamous case of the woman that cut off her husband's manhood. When Lorena married John Bobbitt, she thought that it was going to be happily ever after. But in reality, John started hurting Lorena the second they tied the knot, physically, emotionally, 
and then he started essaying her. This guy was a huge a-hole. Unemployed while his wife worked two jobs, forced Lorena to end a pregnancy that she wanted to keep cheating on her. But on top of all of that, he would go out, get super drunk every night, then come home and S.A. Lorena. Then one night in June of 1993, after John essayed his wife and passed out drunk, his wife Lorena went to the kitchen to get herself a glass of water, where a large cutting instrument was in plain view, which Lorena took back into her bedroom and cut off John's member. She then got in her car and left and threw it out the car window but somehow they were able to find it in time and reattach it after a nine hour surgery there was actually two trials in this story one for what lorena did to john and one for what john did to lorena and they were actually both found not guilty they obviously divorced and went on to live very different lives. Today, Lorena is a wife and mother and also the founder of her own foundation against domestic violence. After the incident, John went on to star in some adult movies. Today, he's unemployed and has been married and divorced three times. And just last week, he publicly announced that after drinking contaminated water, he had to have all 10 of his toes recently amputated which doctors were unable to reattach. The recent discovery of the body of a young female in the dunes of Saldana Bay led many to believe that this was in fact Jocelyn Smith. This has since been confirmed to not be true. However, it has led to so many questions being asked about a town that has had much publicity over the last few months. On a side note, for those who have been asking for an update in the Jocelyn Smith case, I'll be posting that in the very next True Crime News Update video. On Friday morning, the 26th of April, the body of 20-year-old Otoms Nayansen was discovered by a group of men who were going fishing. Her body was discovered on the beach near a holiday resort around 9am. Items of clothing were later found on nearby dunes by the Saldana Bay Police and are believed to belong to the young girl. She, however, was found lying without any clothing on her back in the sand. She was from Middlepost, attended school at Dyersville High School and had last been seen at the community soup kitchen the night before. According to police, the investigation is in its infancy and any information into the case can be directed to the investigating officer, Hein Schmidlin. As always, if there are any public updates in the case, I'll be sure to keep you posted. Have you ever heard the crazy story on how the show To Catch a Predator with Chris Hansen got cancelled? If you have never seen that show before, it was so ahead of its time. So basically, Chris Hansen and his team would go online and pretend to be children or teenagers and chat with online predators and then invite the creeps over saying like, my parents aren't home. Then the creeps would go over to what they thought was a child's home, but be greeted with Chris Hansen and get arrested. Typically the men that they would catch on the show would be lowlifes with no real influence in society at all. Until Texas District Attorney Bill Conrad started chatting with one of the show's online decoys, sending inappropriate photos to what he thought was an underage boy. On every single episode of the show, they had to convince these online online creeps to actually meet up in person, but Bill didn't want to meet in person. This is complete speculation, but I'm assuming that the network knew that catching a district attorney on their show would be really good for ratings. And since Bill did not want to meet, they took camera crew, police officers, SWAT teams, and raided Bill's home. This is unlike anything the show had done before. And with cameras rolling, before they were even able to speak with him, Bill Conrad unalived himself. People that were at the scene apparently immediately started talking about how this was gonna make really good TV. And Dateline did go on to air an episode that featured Bill. But there was some controversy, of course. The judge that signed the search and arrest warrant apparently said that they were never made aware that a reality TV show was involved in this arrest at all and said if they had known, they would never have signed it. Experts have also said that the raid was unnecessary drama for the cameras and put everyone involved in unnecessary danger. And that the investigation was just rushed in general because this was reality TV and they wanted a quick turnaround for the episode. Bill's sister did go on to file a wrongful death lawsuit against NBC, which was settled for an undisclosed amount. And within months of this all happening, the very popular TV show was canceled. There's so much controversy about how this all went down, but what do you think? 
And if you were a fan of this show, did you ever hear about this before? Just before dawn, a cyclist was out taking a morning ride and they came across a gruesome discovery. Just five miles away from her home, Lauren Astley's body was discovered in a marsh. And when she was recovered from the water, it was immediately clear what her cause of death was. And what's crazy is nobody, not a single person, could have predicted what would happen to her. Lauren was found with a bungee cord around her neck and a gaping wound to her throat. 18-year-old Lauren Dunn Astley had been strangled to death and stabbed multiple times by someone who the police had already spoken to, and I know you all know who it was. That day, investigators learned a lot more about Nathan Fujita and just what a massive toll the breakup had taken on him. He had not been the same since. And his mom, of course, had really picked up on this, knew something had to be really wrong. She had actually taken him to the psychiatrist. And what's crazy is his mom actually secretly visited Lauren at work and asked her if she could go and talk to her son. You know, maybe try and cheer him up, just try to have more of a civil conversation from like a friendly perspective. Maybe she didn't know all the details of their relationship and how, I mean, I don't know. I just don't think it was Lauren's responsibility to ever do that. And I'm sure his mother feels terrible about asking her to do that because she probably for sure never could have imagined how that meeting would end. And truth be told, Lauren was actually worried about him herself. I mean, I think she'd also really seen this change in him and of course there was a part of her that still cared about him and she wanted to help him she definitely wasn't worried enough to get back together with him but she was willing to go and talk to him it just shows what a kind person lauren was but sadly though this act of kindness would actually get her killed breaking news the remains of six women were just found in a man's apartment i'm starting to see why you guys are choosing the bear the suspect was first caught when he allegedly broke into his neighbor's apartment on April 16th and essayed and strangled her 17-year-old daughter. That's when the teenager's mother returned to the apartment and saw him leaving and he slashed her throat and fled. The poor mother survived the attack and her daughter did not. And after investigating rooms that the man previously rented, they found bones, blood, a saw, cell phones, and the ID cards of missing women. They also found the remains of six women and other biological material, and one news outlet reported that the remains that were found were literal skulls. They said that the search clearly indicates that they're looking at a possible serial killer of women. They also said they found notebooks that may well be the narrations of the acts that Miguel carried out against his victims. He was writing literal stories about the things he was doing, and at this time he was already being held over the murders of two women. Rest in peace to his poor victims, and as always, I'll keep you guys updated. How did Kevin Porter Jr. go from making $80 million in the NBA to playing in just a small Greek gym making only 10K? Well, see, life hasn't always been. This is where the red flags started to appear. See, after appearing in only a few games his freshman year, he was suspended indefinitely by USC for personal conduct issues. Now, he ended up missing almost that entire season, but played in the last three games. The absence, though, did not stop him from foregoing his education and entering the NBA draft. And even with all the conduct issues, the Cavs took a chance on him. Porter quickly earned his NBA debut, but was immediately suspended for a game without pay because he made improper contact with a ref. Off the court, things were just falling apart as well. He was a arrested for improper handling of a firearm in a vehicle and the cabs they had enough of him so they sent him off to houston now here he would actually find a balance like getting fined fifty thousand dollars for violating league health protocols one day and then the next day having 50 points and 11 assists his play continued to be stellar so despite all the issues the rockets offered him an 82 million dollar contract but then 
on September 11th, 2023. He was arrested and charged by the New York Police Department for allegedly assaulting his girlfriend. He accepted a plea deal with the NYPD and pled guilty to misdemeanor charges but was barred from the NBA forever. Now, he's playing in Greece in front of just a few dozen people and only earning $10,000 a season. So, this is all hail b-ball. And remember, off the court is just as important as what happens on. Breaking news, the remains of six women have been found inside of a man's apartment. Authorities say the investigation began when he allegedly broke into a neighbor's apartment on April 16th. From there, he essayed and strangled a 17-year-old girl. The victim's mother returned home shortly after and saw the man leaving. It was at that point he slashed her throat and then fled. According to authorities, the mother was able to survive, however, the daughter did not. With the mother's assistance, they were able to identify the suspect only as, quote, Miguel. After the incident, they searched his apartment and, quote, clearly indicated we are looking at a possible serial killer of women. Authorities also confirmed that notebooks were located that, quote, may well be narrations of the acts that Miguel carried out against his victims. In addition, they found cell phones and ID cards belonging to multiple women. They said that five of the ID cards found belonged to women who have been located alive. However, they did not specify how many belonged to women who are still missing or deceased. Prosecutors did confirm that there were remains of six women found in his rented room. Quote, other biological material was also found in the rooms. In addition to the ID cards and cell phones found, they also found bones, B-L-O-O-D, and a saw. At this time, authorities have not provided any further details. To stay up to date on this case, make sure you click the playlist below. What do you guys think? Drop in the comments. Thanks to a deathbed confession, a nearly 24-year-old cold case was closed this week when the bodies of a missing girl and her mother were found. 10-year-old Natasha Alex Carter and her mother Susan disappeared from their home in Beckley, West Virginia in August 2000. But at first, police initially reported that Alex may have been abducted by her mother. In a press release from December 2021 about the case, the FBI Pittsburgh said, quote, at the time of their disappearance, Susan Carter and Alex's father were having a custody dispute, and Alex moved in with her mother and mother's new husband, which it's not confirmed that it was actually her mother's new husband, but they moved in, and then not long after that, Susan and Alex disappeared. But while it was initially suspected as a parental abduction by Susan, after the two remained missing, an investigation into other possibilities ensued. But unfortunately, the case went cold. In 2021, the FBI reopened the cold case and started looking into the man Susan and Alex were living with, Larry Webb. Searches of his home were done in 2022 and 2023, and they found a bullet embedded in the wall of what was Alex's bedroom. The bullet was tested for DNA, and it confirmed that blood on it belonged to Alex. In October 2023, Larry Webb was indicted on first-degree murder charges for Alex's death, despite Alex and Susan's bodies never being found. Due to his deteriorating health, though, Webb was not arrested until April 12, 2024, but since then, he was being held without bond. On Monday, he had a medical episode, after which, in a, quote, come-to-Jesus moment on his deathbed, he confessed to authorities what he had done. Webb claimed that on August 8, 2000, he had gotten into an argument with Susan over money. He said he was missing some cash and believed that she had taken it and spent it. The argument escalated and he shot her, and then he ended up shooting Alex so there would be no witnesses. Webb then wrapped their bodies in bed linens and placed them in the basement that night. Over the next two nights, he dug a shallow grave in the woods on his property, eventually burying them in his clothes and then walking free for the next 20 years. On April 22nd, 2024, Larry Webb died at Mount Olive Correctional Complex, and six hours later, Susan and Alex's remains were found at his property in Beckley. Unfortunately, now that Webb is dead, he cannot be charged in connection to their deaths. At least now they have been found and can be properly laid to rest. Alex's father, Rick Lafferty, said after the discovery, quote, it's kind of a sad day, but also a happy day because I can bring my baby home. Rest in peace, Alex and Susan. The mommy blogger that killed her own child. This is like the Gypsy Rose case with an even more devastating ending. Lacey Spears said that she always wanted to be a mom and it was like a dream come true when her son Garnett was born. But only days after Garnett was born, his mother Lacey was taking him to the ER saying that he was very sick and wasn't eating. And at only a few months old, at his mother's request, 
Garnett had a feeding tube put in and his throat closed so he wouldn't be able to throw up. Remember that for later because it'll be important. Garnett was a very sick child and his mother Lacey would document it all on her blog and her social media accounts, but in reality, Lacey was the sick one. Garnett was perfectly healthy. Lacey was purposefully making her child sick for sympathy, attention, and online clout. Like many times before, in January of 2014, Lacey took her son, Garnett, to the ER, this time saying that he was experiencing seizures. After multiple tests, the nurses and doctors didn't see any seizure activity happening with Garnett, so they were getting ready to discharge him from the hospital. Within 10 minutes of the nurses and doctors leaving Garnett's hospital room, Garnett went from being a perfectly healthy five-year-old boy to being brain dead and then passing away with no medical explanation why. Hospital staff was super suspicious, so they reported it to the police. Garnett had passed away from a lethal amount of sodium found in his system with no explanation on how it got there. An investigation started right away, and really quickly, there was a lot of suspicious stuff that started being uncovered about his mom. They got a search warrant for their home, and where all of Garnett's medical supplies was, like all of his medicine, his feeding tube, his feeding bags, there was a container of sea salt. And a friend of Lacey's told the police that like immediately after Garnett passed away in the hospital, Lacey was texting her being like, yo, go into my house and throw out all of Garnett's feeding tubes and feeding bags, but don't tell anyone why. So suspicious, I can't believe she didn't know that she was gonna get caught. So obviously they tested the feeding bags that were in the home and in the trash, and they all contained a large amount of salt in them. And then a bomb dropped. There was security footage that Lacey didn't know about from Garnett's hospital room. Parts of it's online. I don't feel comfortable showing it, but you can find it online if you want. But it shows five-year-old Garnett sitting in his hospital bed, looking super healthy, bouncing around on his bed. And then when the doctors and nurses leave the room, shows his mother take the feeding tube, take Garnett out of the bed, who's super healthy, take him into the bathroom. And then Garnett leaves the bathroom, an extremely sick child in a lot of pain and trying to throw up. But Garnett was unable to throw up the poison that his mother had just given him because she had had his throat closed when he was only a newborn. Lacey was found guilty and sentenced to 25 years to life in prison, and to this day, she's never admitted what she did or shown any remorse for what she did and the five years of torture and pain that she did to her child. 